so yeah, so I'm going to be talking about uh, testing code. So I think probably everybody in this room has written code significantly, and I hope some of you have at least done some form of testing of your own code. Um, but I'm going to give you some uh, you know, words of wisdom and advice about how to do that to maybe better uh, than you have been, hopefully. So the first thing, uh, why do we write tests of our code? Um, why not just kind of you know, run the code? If it doesn't look right, it's probably a bug. Go look for the bug, find the bug, fix it. Why do we write tests? Nobody has an idea. Yeah. <laughs> you have a little more confidence that maybe this is actually working properly. Good. Yep. Great, that's right. So you can test kind of smaller chunks individually rather than testing the whole thing at once, whereas if the whole thing fails, you may not know which module the problem is, but testing each chunk separately uh, is more effective. Good, yeah. Okay. Uh, the library you're using somehow changes, you can make sure your code still uh, Great, so this would be what I would call regression testing. So you test if something breaks your code, you find out right away rather than in the middle of a run that's using millions of CPU hours or something. Right. So, is it compatible with other other people's code? Good. Yep. Good. So, these are all definitely part of the answer. Uh, here's some of the ones that I thought of. Um, so, one to find bugs as soon as possible. This relates to uh, some of the things you guys said. The quicker you find the bugs, the less of a problem the bugs tend to be. If you find the bugs farther down the line, that's more difficulty for you than if you find them right away. So writing tests helps you find them sooner. Um, Nose regressions, we actually already talked about that. If you accidentally break some other part of your code that you're not working on, you want to find out and, and fix that. Um, this is one that I think is, is highly underappreciated. Um, I've heard it said that uh, the difference between a, a good coder and a great coder is how often they do refactoring. <laughs> um, so everybody should probably be doing refactoring more often than you are. And it's much easier to have the confidence to do a refactoring of your code. Uh, if you have a good unit test, it'll tell you whether you're doing the same functionality. And now maybe the point of the refactoring brings you to do it faster or more efficiently. Uh, portability uh, tests are much easier. So if you've got it working on your laptop, you want to make sure it's going to work at NERSC. You want to make sure it works at you know, BNL computers. You want to make sure it works at Slack computers. Right? You can have a kind of a coherent test suite, run it on a bunch of different places, and First time, usually it fails uh, for various different reasons, different compilers, different you know, libraries, stuff like that. And the last one, which is also, uh, I think, underappreciated for tests, is actually helps you design your, your code. Um, when you're writing the test, you're acting like your user. Right? A lot of times when we write code, we're, we're thinking about, like, how do I need this algorithm to work? How do I want the, the internal structure to be? What's the math that I need to implement? But the API is usually something we kind of just slough off to the end and well, some function, that'll, that'll work, right? When you're writing your test, you're the user of your own code. And you can see kind of what's the clunky parts. What are the parts that, oh, this was this a really kind of awkward way to, to structure that. I have to make this and then call this other function and call this other function. I should write a, a helper thing that it's actually how the user's going to interact with my code. So designing the API is actually easier if you're also writing your test at the same time. These are some reasons, at least. Okay. One thing that I can also hear is that sort of a recommendation to the talk. Sure. It's kind uh, of the definitive statement of what what you think. That's right. So so it is in a, in a sense the the ultimate documentation. So what works for the unit test is the documented functionality of the code. That's a good point. Uh, okay. Good. Um. So we talked about finding bugs. Well, what kind of bugs are we looking for? What are, the, what are the typical bugs that you guys find in your code? I'm sure you've all had bugs in your code. <laughs> Maybe there's some super coders out there that don't. But, yeah. Logic errors. Logic errors, great. Yeah, so that's that's kind of the classic one. Like, it does the if statement, do the thing that I wanted it to do. Does the loop end at the right place? Are the invariants proper? Like, all those kind of logic algorithmic problems, definitely.
Great, right. So you might be thinking about the code in terms of processing some math, but at some some values might give it problems, right? And so, so does does it reach the full range of possible input parameters that you, you know you could be allowed? Great, yeah. I guess there are questions, but I'll just like introduce some variables and functions in the previous version. I think that's the cost that variable in order to expect the variable. I don't understand the function. Yep. So this is like when you break the API of things that other co other parts of your code were counting on it being one way, and then you wanted to add a new feature, and you actually en ended up breaking some other code that was already working previously. You want to find that out as soon as you possible. Okay. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Compatibility with other uh, packages. That's right. So that. Hmm. Three. <laughs> Item three. Right. Uh, other. Other ideas? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, catastrophic errors. I actually didn't write that one down, but that's a great point. Those, those absolutely do happen. Yes, good. <laughs> uh, yeah. Edge cases, good, right. So uh, it may work most of the time, but you, you want to be able to find the places where there's a little bit kind of confusing that it, it might not uh, work, and unit tests are a better way to find that than just running this much. Okay, good. So these are all good answers. So here's some of the ones I thought of. So there's in the math, or we're scientific programming in a lot of cases. So usually we have a math formula. And a lot of times you can write the, the code to implement some formula one way, but there's a there's a more straightforward kind of true by inspection way to write the code where you can look at the math and know that it's right, but that's probably not the most efficient way to write the code. So you want to be able to compare the, the math uh, simplifications that you've done to write the code more efficiently. Um, Numerical accuracy is one no one mentioned, but this is one that I uh, find pretty important. Is um, you know, there's a lot of times where, where the math, you know, in pure math is going to be perfect, but numerical rounding errors will crop up. And if you write the code in certain ways, those numerical inaccuracies can become large and, and get, get compounded and be kind of too big for what what level of accuracy you need. Uh, and unit tests are a good way to kind of figure that out uh, whether things are accurate enough. Um, the output format, so we, we output things uh, and then read them back in a lot of times, so making sure all of that works properly uh, with different uh, file formats. Uh, bad data is one that um, is actually pretty hard to, to kind of get, but it's something you want to try to get in your in a unit test. Um, you know, what happens if, if the input has not uh, has uh, NANDs in it, right, say, or uh, if something that you, you assumed was positive, what if there's a couple negative values in there because of noise or, or just the user screwed up or that kind of thing. Um, uh, exceptional cases so is kind of the edge case that you mentioned. Uh, one that I find is, is usually worth, try, you know, in particular, trying to get your code to do is uh, does it handle singular matrices properly or near singular matrices? So sometimes your data, you know, will, will get to a place where you have ill-conditioned matrices, and you want to make sure that your your code can handle those properly. Um, uh, we already talked about this, but discrepancies from kind of previous versions is what Renee mentioned. Like, your code used to work, now it doesn't. That's the that's kind of error that you're looking for. Uh, and then changes in the API. You want to make sure that you, you haven't broken any code that had previously been working. Good. <coughs> um, so when you read up on kind of software testing, most of it's written by business people. <laughs> um, so they kind of use some different language. And they, they like to classify things into lots and lots of different things. They, about you know, regression tests and black box tests and white box tests and gray box tests and there's a, there's a whole slew of ways that they they slice and dice uh, tests. I think these are kind of the, the most useful way of thinking about the kind of three levels of software testing. So right? this is kind of the language I'm going to try to use. So unit tests are tests that check kind of just one item at a time, right? just a small unit of code. Uh, make sure that it actually does the functionality that you want, that it, it you know, the, um, you know, works as documented, uh, and kind of independent of everything else. So you're not testing how it relates to any other parts of your code. It's just testing it. Does it do what it's supposed to do and what it says? Uh, and then integration tests are, are more kind of do the different units of your code work together properly, OK? Uh, so for example, in, in, in Galson, we have lots of different kinds of surface brightness profiles, and they can all draw an image. They can all, they're all supposed to be able to draw themselves. And then the draw image command has a whole bunch of different options, right? So we can unit test the draw image function 
and check that all those options do what they are supposed to. And we can text, test each of those uh, service brightness profiles to make sure they all have the right kind of uh, implementation. But some of our integration tests are we test kind of all different combinations of those with lots of different combinations of options on the drawing. I do all of the kind of different ways of, of you know, passing through those uh, options all kind of still work together properly. Um, and, you know, it's, it wasn't uncommon as we were writing those tests, we find that, oh, actually, you have the box profile, right, a pixel, you know, because it has such hard edges, broke some of the assumptions that we hadn't noticed until we started doing the So integration tests are when you kind of combine all your units in various combinations. Uh, and also, uh, when you combine it with external um, like databases or uh, input files, these would also be kind of considered integration type things where you're kind of taking an external um, uh, you know, module and does that work properly with your so these, these would be considered integration tests. Uh, and then finally, system tests are kind of the whole thing at once. So this would be like um, you know a working example running on real data all the way through to the end of it output the right thing. Uh, so in Gaussian, we have uh, example demo file or demo scripts that run through a, a full complete uh, simulation. Those would be kind of our, our system test. Does the whole thing work at, at once? Probably most of you have written system tests. <laughs> um, you may not have thought of them as system tests, but like if you write a script to make a plot, like a, a matplotlib plot, for instance, the system test is you look at the plot and you say, well, that doesn't look right. <laughs> right. And then you go and you find out where the bug is. And for scripts, actually, I think system tests are really all you need. Like a script kind of by design is all the units are other people's code. <laughs> now, you didn't write any of the units there usually. I mean, as you get more complicated, you'll start to. But you basically are just running through a bunch of units, integrating them together to make one final output. And that output is you know what it's supposed to look like, and your your brain is the, is the tester. Right? You can just look and say, oh, that's, that's not doing what I thought it should be doing. Uh, and that's fine. And that's probably the only test you actually need for kind of a simple script like that. You don't need to kind of ramp up and do these other kinds of tests for every single kind of program you write. But as you get more complicated, you know, you're going to want to start doing these uh, more basic level tests uh, of your code. OK. So I'm going to focus mostly on unit tests, because I think that's probably where most people have the have too little experience. Like I said, you've all been doing system tests. I'm not really going to talk much about that. I might mention integration tests again. But for the rest, I'm mostly going to be just talking about unit tests. So what's a unit? I think I have an idea. What, what, are we, what are we talking about when we're talking about a unit test? What's a unit? David. A class. OK, good. Um, the whole class, everything that it does? Could be, could be, possibly. A function, right? So one single function, good, maybe. That, no, someone. A particular algorithm, maybe, right? So, so maybe not even the whole function, but maybe just one particular aspect internal to it. Maybe there's some branch that goes into a, a certain algorithm within that function, just like that one function, or that one algorithm. Absolutely, right? Anyone else have an idea? Some feature. It's the level of the sky or something. Some, some single feature. Yeah. Right, good. Sure That's good. So these are all, all definitely possibly things that you could consider a unit. Um, the way I like to think of it, and this is my own opinion, so you can kind of define it your own way, but I think of it as a, a single unit of action. And typically, that means a single line of the user code, not a single line of the back end code, but a single thing that the user would do, right? So for the class, I would say like the construction of a class, right? Like making making a single instance that line of code, that's that's kind of a unit, right? Uh, and so you might want to test this in all different ways, like different ways to uh, construct it. A single function call we mentioned, right? That function, the user is just interacting with that in a single way. Um, Sometimes if a function has kind of lots of different uh, options to it, you might consider like just the stereographic option, right? And that would be one unit, and then you might have a whole separate unit that you, in your in your brain of you know the, the, the mnemonic projection, another one, the Lambert projection, whatever. Um, and sometimes just using a particular object in a documented way that's not necessarily any of these, but like calling a sign of an angle, right? That that's a, a thing that is in this uh, class that will be uh, looking at, right? 
So kind of any single uh, user line of code is the way I think about units. Okay. You can expand from that, you can shrink from that, but that's kind of the, the starting point for where you, you want to be thinking about uh, what, are you, what are you actually wanting to be testing. Each line of code is good. Okay. So that's a unit. What does the unit test do? What are we, what are, what's the, the mechanics of, of, of making a good unit test? So just to test one unit, what, what, is, what does it need to do? Like if you're going to write a unit test, yeah. So you, you control the case and you look at the output, right? And Perfect, right. So we run the line of code, basically, and we check that the thing that comes out from that is the way we expect it. That's, that's exactly right. So we can think of it as three, three stages to most unit tests. Uh, not all of them do the first stage, um, but in general, you have some kind of setup where you create the objects necessary. They're kind of preconditions for the line that you're going to be testing. You have to make the objects and that are going to have the methods you're going to call or um, take the, the things that are going to be parameters to your function, whatever they're going to be. You run the actual code, the, the, that line that, that you wanted to test. Um, maybe do some, cal some separate calculation, a parallel calculation, to, so you can uh, know what the right answer is. You may not just be able to assert you know, what is the actual answer that I'm expecting, but you may be able to do some different way of calculating it that's more obviously true. Um, but then the main thing is this last thing, is assert that the result was as expected. And I use the word assert, not uh, check, because assert is the actual uh, function call or fun the function name in most programming languages, including Python. You assert and then something that you think should be. Okay? So, so it, the way I think about unit tests, Every assert statement is a unit test. They don't all have to be separate functions, but every single assert is a separate test. And every time you assert something to be true, you're you're doing some test of your unit. Okay? Mine have many. Some people say you should only have one assert per function. I think that's kind of <laughs> unwieldy, <laughs> inefficient. Uh, and, and yeah, there's onerous, I think, is what you make the word. Um, but that's a style point. And some, you'll see some of my uh, test functions have many asserts. And each assert statement to me is a unit test. And I put all of the tests of a particular unit into a single function. Right? That's the way I organize my stuff. You don't have to do it that way. People have different styles on this. That's totally fine. All right. So we know what a unit test does. What makes a unit test a good unit test? <laughs> what do you think? Uh, it, obviously, you can write code well or poorly. So, what what are the things we might want to keep in mind for writing good unit tests? Covering covering all the different uh, lines of code. Good. Yeah. Competition is expensive. Good. So that means it runs quickly. It's just really a, an important point. We don't want our unit test to take a week. <laughs> uh, and every time you change your code, you have to wait a week to find out if you broke it. Uh, testing something, what do you mean by that? Uh, so make sure you check all the states that might be relevant. Um, okay. Good, right. Right, so I'll say that so the more complex the code, the more you want to check all the different possible ways that it could be failing. That may be, may be a summary. Okay, good. Uh, ah, okay, so, so I would say that is unlikely to be possible. <laughs> um, I have a rule of thumb that half of all your bugs are in your test. <laughs> and if your test suite is about as long as your code, that's probably the right split up, right? So the, the point is that when, you, when, when your tests fail, 
right? Keep in mind that it could just as easily be a, a failure in your test as a failure in your underlying code that you're trying to test, right? You can make mistakes in both places. So, you know, making it robust just involves kind of that iterative process of trying to run it and see if it fails and, and diagnose where the bug is. But it won't, there's, I don't think, I don't know of a way to make unit tests intrinsically robust prior to just running. Uh, good thought, though. <laughs> Other points? Excellent, yes. So when they fail, you want it to be very, very clear what, where the failure happened. That's exactly right. That's, an, that's a big one. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay. Um, so it's sort of the idea that I was saying, like, do things a different way, right? So I, th I think that's, that's a good point. So if you have two two alternate ways to test the same code, doing both of them is a good is a good strategy. And um, yeah, so it, you should get them both to pass. <laughs> and, and in that case, it, it could be in any of the three <laughs> when it when it fails, right? Um, but yeah, that's uh, <laughs> you, know, you you always have to keep up with the idea of like you could have made a button mistake anywhere. So, uh, but yeah, no, that's that's a good point. So if you have multiple ways of testing the same thing, probably write them write them all, uh, and yeah, as long as they're all in the same position, uh, that's that's a good strategy. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So so don't. Exactly right. So so test the the things that that are relevant to to the what might be breaking. I think that was someone that was his point. Uh, the, the test the parts that where where you think there's a, a reasonable chance of, of breakage. That's right. That's not a. That's right. Yes, that's a, that's absolutely the case. Okay, so let's go on. I, you got a lot of these already. So uh, so this one. Clearly identify where where it gets wrong, where the problem is. Uh, easy to run, so make sure that it's 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 not kind of. It doesn't require a whole big setup. You don't have to kind of load some database and blah 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 in order to run them. Because it should just be like a single command. Nose test, boom, run the test. Good. Runs quickly. We don't want to wait forever. Um, the Gaussian unit tests are starting to take a <laughs> two minutes, I think, which is is on the edge of being onerous. Um, uh, has consistent results. So this is something that's uh, anything that uses kind of random numbers internally, uh, you want to make sure you set a specific random uh, seed uh, for those unit tests that use random variables. Otherwise, you know, everything will be working fine, and then once a month you'll get some failure. You're like, what? That doesn't make any sense. Let me change something. Oh, I fixed it. Good. And it was, in fact, just some random thing that happened once a month. <laughs> right. So you don't want that. You want all your unit tests should use very specific random seeds for anything that has a, a pseudo random. Yeah, so so that, that's how Travis would work. So if if you break the um, yeah, if you if you break the code, it'll let you know. Uh, but if it, if everything's working, it's basically fine. Okay. Um, yeah, so there's certainly part, parts of how, we'll talk about how we run unit tests, but but there's uh, certainly for some aspects that that's definitely how you want to touch on. Um, Can you uh, say more about the random aspect? Sure. I seem to remember with one of the n-body codes there was a problem when the coordinate of the particle was precisely zero to the six digits. So yeah. <laughs> well, uh, so you would definitely want to have a unit test like any when you find that that happens to be the case, you'd want to add a unit test where it's Zero or four, ten to the minus twelve or something, and check that the code works there. But you don't want it to just be kind of randomly showing up every once in a while. You get a failure of unit tests, and, and you, you don't really understand why. You run it again and it works fine, and run it on another code it works fine. Uh, okay, I'll ignore it, and then a month later it shows up again. Right? That's just trouble, <laughs> right? So anything that has that, you want to just put in a, a particular seed, so you know that for this unit test, it's deterministic. Right? It's not going to randomly fail because of this weird thing. But you know, randomly failing, you know, if you can figure it out what, what was causing it, because you know, 10 to the minus 12 is a problem, make a unit test that says put in 10 to the minus 12 on purpose. Right. So there's there's both aspects of that. Um, 
Um, and the last one I'm gonna say is easy to write. So this is um, a little bit hard to, you know, like, what do you mean by easy to write? But um, don't kind of bend over backwards trying to conform to somebody's idea of how unit tests should be, okay? Including my own, right? I have my own style. I like the way I write unit tests. It may not fit with your personality. If you like having a separate function for every, uh, every single assert, by all means do that. I find that not so easy to write. <laughs> so I'd rather kind of just uh, organize in, in larger chunks and have a bunch of assert statements. That's kind of what I mean by easy to write. So don't make it extra hard on yourself just to conform to something that's not actually helpful, right? Do the thing that's easy for you, right? Okay. Uh, okay, so you guys hopefully have mostly uh, downloaded this Chord uh, module. It's a pretty simple uh, module and it does things that most of you, uh, if you deal with data, may have use for. So please feel free to you know, use this code in, in anything you're writing. But it basically just does simple things with angles and coordinates on the sky, does the square the trigonometry, uh, distances between points on the sky, things like that. So I'll just go through a couple of the uh, unit tests that I have here, just so you can see kind of the, the way that I write things. Um, so here's kind of a super simple unit test. Uh, it tests the initialization of angle unit, which is one of our, our classes. Uh, and in particular, we make gradients, which is not a very standard unit, but it's a, it's a real thing. <laughs> you can look it up on Wikipedia. No, I didn't make it up. Uh, but it's uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, 100th of a right angle uh, is a gradient. Close to degrees, but not quite. Um, and so we, we make this kind of weird unit that nobody really ever uses, except in unit tests, or it's my unit test. <laughs> um, we make it, and then we assert that its internal value, which is the way we can uh, know what happened, is equal to the value we put in. So there's, there's almost no actual code going on. This function does little more than assign to that value, <laughs> the value that you give it. Um, and then we have a, a comment here. So in, in, not all of you may be aware of this, but in the Python assert statement, you assert this is the thing that you want to be true, and then this is some string, which doesn't, do anything unless you fail, and then that string will show up on your screen. So in this case, it's pretty gratuitous. So I would actually leave this off, if, but for, <laughs> for the pedagogical purposes, I put it in. But as your unit tests are kind of testing more complicated things, it may not be obvious from this statement what actually the failure that you were trying to get across was, right? So you might have this, and you might say, oh, when I you know do this first complicated thing and then undo it and then go back the other way, it doesn't end up where it started, right? That may be a thing you'll want to put in that string to let yourself know if this fails, what, what was I actually talking about, right? For this kind of thing, I would leave it off because this statement itself is already documentation enough about what we are. But that, that's a, a useful thing to be able to do, yeah. Right. So not in this case, but you're right in general. Um, in this case, there was no calculation going on. <laughs> So it took this value and assigned it to a place, and then we're checking that it actually got assigned there properly. So it's a pretty <laughs> trivial unit test. But you're right, if there's any ever any calculation, we don't want to use uh, assert equals, and I'll show you what we're doing. Don't have the it, it'll, it'll give you all of the, would actually say that, that state. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, so right. So if you think it's going to be self-documenting the failure, you can leave off the string. And I, I usually leave off the string because most of the time I find it fairly self-documenting. But sometimes it, it's useful to be able to fill in it. Where is this in uh, In in the test directory. Yeah. So if you want to follow along, you can. You can. So in the core uh, repository, there's a test directory which has all the tests. This one is in test angle unit .py. Um, You did not do the homework. <laughs> <laughs> if you had done the homework, you know the answer to Renee's question. But uh, if you look at the uh, BE School page, there's a link to where you should be downloading it. Uh, you can look online rather than clone it to your local computer if you like. That's fine. OK. Um, so now we're just going to keep going just to show you a little bit more uh, complicated things. Um, so this is uh, answering the question of what happens, so it's, it's not really necessary here, but another way to do an assert is with uh, a numpy.testing module. So this is what I, most of 
my assert statements are actually using the NumPy testing, um, mostly because it makes it very easy to test almost equals. Uh, and there's two different ways uh, to do it. This one, uh, so assert almost equal, and then you can give it two values. Right? In this case, again, they're um, going to be exact. But if, it, if one of them involves a calculation, they may not be exact to the last decimal place. So you can tell it almost equals, which tests, I think, by default to seven decimal places, maybe. And uh, you can tell it how many decimal places you want. Uh, and there's another one, too, that I'll uh, also mention soon. But, um, and you can see, so, so in this case, I, di I did everything kind of all on one line. So, so in this case, I would say you even less need any kind of string uh, documentation, because this has the whole thing, right? It's right that this. This is this is the value that we just calculated is equal to the you know, value we expected to be. Uh, so it, it combines both the, the do the statement and assert the result uh, in one. So if it's a small enough thing, that's totally fine. Do that kind of thing. It's almost equal to nine. Um, yeah, equal to um, I think it's eight decimal places. And you can you can set how many decimal places you want. So there's a, a third parameter you can give. You can, if you want it to be twelve decimal places, you can say comma decimal equals twelve. Uh, that's a different one, which I'll get to in a, in a little bit. That's uh, assert all close. <laughs> so. uh, right, and so here's the here's the example of that. So if you want to tell it how many decimal places, you can and this almost equal type stuff, this doesn't exist in Python. It's NumPy, but yeah, NumPy is practically pure Python. <laughs> so, no, we're indices that you can't understand. <laughs> well, there's that. That's a separate. We're not going to do any of that stuff. So. Uh, okay. Oh, and then the other thing I'm going to so I always like to document uh, with a comment what I'm actually trying to test here, right? So a lot of times, you know, English language is easier to read than the code. Sometimes not, but a lot of times it is. So just like, what am I doing? Oh, non-float value. Okay, because this is a NumPy float64 <coughs> thing rather than just a regular float. Okay, non-float value is okay as long as it's convertible. So that's what I'm checking. Those are helpful just to kind of help organize your thoughts when you're writing the unit test. And if everything fails, you can come back and see what what, what were we trying to do there. Uh, okay, uh, another thing we didn't talk too much about, I guess is the, the bad user input, but uh, it's useful to make sure that if the user does something wrong that doesn't follow the API, that it gives a reasonable error message. And so the way to do that is with the NumPy testing stuff. Uh, you can say NumPy testing assert raises, that means this will fail if it doesn't raise the exception that you're telling it it's supposed to raise, right? And the way it works, so you can imagine from here on, right, turn this to a parenthesis, and that's the function that it's doing. So it's creating an angle unit with degrees as the first parameter, and that's not a, val not a valid thing. An angle unit is supposed to take a float value. Um, and so that's invalid, and it'll raise a type error because for that degrees is not convertible to a float. Um, so, uh, here, We're testing that if so, so this function will call this. Uh, so the, the assert raises will take these parameters and say it's expecting to get a type error raise. And the thing that it's expecting to do that is if I call this function with these parameters, it's one, one parameter. So it'll it'll do angle unit degrees as a function, and you're testing a that. type error will get raised. Okay. And it says, yep, a type error got raised. Great, we pass. Uh, It may or may not, right? So, but part of the API is what happens when you do the wrong thing, and so you can you can put in those explicitly, or you can let kind of some uh, you yeah, know when it hits some statement that's invalid, Python itself will raise exception for it sometimes, and that's fine. Uh, well, if you change something, right? So, so you're you set up the code originally, right? And you you, you kind of it's sort of uh, David's point. This is sort of the documentation of the API, right? If you make any of these mistakes, this is the thing that the assertion that, or the is the the error, the exception that gets raised, right? And now later down the line, someone says, "Oh, I 
want to add this and that and the other thing, right? And they accidentally delete one of these tests or they, they change how it works a little bit. Like maybe they allow a string for some reason because of, you know, what, sometimes strings can get converted dynamically automatically, right? And, it, and this this might fail now and you may say, oh yeah, I wasn't supposed to allow spam as a valid angle unit. Let me go. I must have just added something that made it break. I, I normally place it as, well, so things like this, I don't know. I and mean, this is kind of, I don't always document all of the particular thing, exceptions that get raised, but um, you know, functionally the API is, you, know, you, want to, you want to make sure it's preserved, right? Whether it's documented or not, people may be relying on it, right? Uh, ideally it would be documented in somewhere where the user could see it. The users don't usually look at this. Uh, but in, in a sense that David was pointing out, like this is kind of the ultimate documentation of, of what is the API. Like these are these are all the things that we, we know are, are actually true. So. Uh, okay, so right, we can test uh, the wrong number of, us, of arguments, the wrong uh, kind of keyword for the, the arguments. These are all, should give, uh, you know, reasonable uh, exceptions. You're never really going to cover all of them. That's true. So this, for this, I agree, it's a little bit gratuitous, but there's, there are definitely cases where, um, yeah, there are there are kind of things that the user would may plausibly do wrong, uh, and you want to make sure it's giving the right kind of error. So there are places in Gaussian, for instance, where if you did it wrong, it gave this really kind of confusing error because it got several steps down into the chain and then and now there was a name error that doesn't make any sense to the user right and so we added tests to, to tell the user right away what their problem was and, and those we made uh, unit tests for um, so you're right it, it's a judgment call how much you want to actually uh, write these kind of unit tests um, but if you think if you think the user may be uh, you know, reasonably making a mistake and you want to make sure you're telling them about that mistake soon and if you do that then you probably want to unit test it can be. Well, it, it, right. So for things as simple as this, you're right. Um, as you get more complicated, you'll, you'll be raising your own value errors for things. And, and so if you have a line in your code that checks something, you want to have a test that check, make sure that your test was right. So yeah, if, you, if you don't have a line in your code that does any of these, then you're right. You may not need to make a unit test for it. Uh, so this is something that uh, I'm just going to show this something that we use in, in Galsim, and it's a, a useful thing um, that you can steal and, and use in your own repositories. So we have this function called do pickle, which does all the tests related to do things pickle properly. So if you don't know what pickling is, in Python, pickling is their word for serialization. So it turns some object into a string that can be written out into a text file and then turned back into the original object. That's the, the package to do that is called pickle. Um, and can you imagine like putting it in a pickle jar, putting it on the shelf for a while, and then later you pull it back into the pickle. I think is the metaphor they're going with. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so we have we have a song in do pickle in our test suite that does a whole bunch of, of tests related to that. Does it have a, a, a proper hash? Can you can use it in dict if it's supposed to? Uh, does it uh, eval? Uh, does does wrapper uh, eval back properly? Does it copyright? Does it deep copyright? All these different kind of things related to serialization, um, and so we have just a, a rule that every single thing we call every single kind of object we call this function to make sure it passes all these kind of standards. Right? Um, if you care about that, you can copy that over. Uh, I think it's a useful thing to to have true about your code. All your objects are pickleable and copyable and deep copyable and, and val replicable. All these different things. If you don't care, don't bother with it. Um, but that's what this is about. That's a good idea. We don't. Um, I think we use C pickle if it's available, and then if not, we import pickle. Uh, we don't check that it's the same answer on both of them. That's an interesting point, though. Uh, yeah. Well, that's right. No. So we don't. We don't try to test against all possible uh, combinations of, of NumPy and AstroPy and SciPy and. <laughs> you can go on forever on that, and, and but you're right. Uh, NumPy does change things every so often that breaks our code and to fix it. Uh, and it's 
part of the point that because you know that. Oh my god, how often how often do you like On Travis, it runs every every commit. Okay, so uh, every commit that's pushed up to, to master, okay. not on a branch. But yeah, Travis Travis runs our full unit tests every every time something gets pushed up to the repository. So on your local machine, you might have several commits before you push, right? And that's fine. Um, but once you push, that's the thing that Travis runs. So we run it every time. Okay. Uh, another one that, uh, of a similar point, just showing you uh, a, a useful thing that we have in, in Gaussian. Uh, you want to check that objects are supposed to be equal, test equal, so it's testing the EQ function. Uh, and also the things that aren't equal, test as being not equal. Um, so the equal ones are usually pretty straightforward. You make things that are supposed to be equal, so pi over 4 radians and 45 degrees, that's the same thing. You can check if they're equal. Um, again, you may or may not need to be careful here. If there's actually an underlying calculation behind the scenes, you might need to do a, a all, all, you know, almost equal or almost or something. In this case, it turns out that the math worked out, so equal is fine. But yeah. caveat uh, program. Um, if you make a copy, it should be equal. But then this is the more interesting one. So these are all things that are supposed to be unequal. Uh, some of them aren't even uh, actual angles. Uh, it's a, it's a class is just a number, that's a none, right? And then check that they're all dipped. So it'll go through and check every possible pair and make sure that they are actually not equal. Um, also that they hash to different values. Uh, what else is in that, Josh? There's a few other things that you check in there. Josh wrote this, this function. So <laughs> uh, I mean, anyway, there's a few things that are kind of sanity checks about things that are supposed to be different make sure that they behave like different objects. And, and so this is a nice, useful thing you can grab also. That's good. Um, I copied it over to Cord, so you can steal it from Cord or Gelsen.com. I took it, I stole it from Gelsen <laughs> for, for this project. Uh, uh, OK, yeah. Right. Um, so usually, I, I would say to first order always. <laughs> um, sometimes it, this is straightforward enough that I, I you know, if you write this test and it fails because it's different at the 10 to minus 16 level, you just change the test because you know, well, it, I, I actually know that these are equivalent and testing it to 15 decimal places is fine. <laughs> right. So if it fails, you can change the test. So that's kind of what I was saying, like half of all bugs are in your test. So if you write it the easy way and it passes, you're probably fine. It's possible that down the line something will happen and this will fail, and then the, the solution will not be to change the code, but to change the test. That's, that's perfectly valid. Uh, and you just have to kind of be aware of, of that that's a possibility. Um, if you want to be super careful, you can write all of your tests with the NumPy testing as sort of all close. But again, testing should be easy. This is a lot easier to write, so I just wrote that. Right? All right, so now we're going to test some actual uh, real calculations. So this is uh, maybe a little bit more interesting. Um, so one of the things that these chord uh, objects can do is they can find the distance between two chord objects. So the, the syntax of it uh, here, so if you have one, so EQ1, which is a place on the equator, uh, distance to EQ2. Right? So that's the actual function we're testing, the distance from one, one coordinate to another. And to start with, we just pick five places on the sphere that are really easy and you can just do kind of by inspection, right? So we have three places on the on the equator. We have one at zero, zero, right? Right at the uh, vernal equinox and, and the celestial equator. One, one radian away, one pi radians away, right? So pi radians were on the other side, it's the opposite direction. Um, and then the North Pole, this could be anything actually. Uh, I picked zero, but it doesn't matter. Um, at pi over two radians, and then the other one at minus pi over two radians, and then it appropriately. And now we can just kind of think about uh, some of the distances. <laughs> so from one to two, right, this is along the equator. That's a great, great equator is a great circle. So that should be one radian. So there's distance in radians. Dot rad is how we break out the, the radian values and angle. Should equal one to 12 decimal places. So that's some calculation. So we know it's not going to be exactly equal, but 12 decimal places is my, my, it's my starting point and if it fails at 12, I'll start thinking about like, well, how, how much did I actually expect it? But 
I don't ever really ever care about 12 versus 15. You can 16 is usually impossible. If it, if it's not perfect, it's not going to be true at 16. Typically, um, that's kind of the level of rounding error that happen. Um, but so so 12 is my starting point when I whenever I know there's calculations involved. Uh, and if it fails, then I'll start thinking about that. Should it actually be maybe a few less than that? Um, this one tested in the opposite direction. EQ2 distance to EQ1. It's the same distance, but in the other direction. Make sure that. It's the same answer, right? That should be. Um, one to three should be pi. Two to three should be pi minus one. These are all kind of straightforward. It'll just move it along the equator. North pole to the south pole, right? Those are also opposite, so they're pi apart. And then anything on the equator to either the north pole or the south pole should be pi over two. So these are all things you can just kind of do without really knowing any spherical trick, right? So those are all, this is always how I start uh, writing tests of, of things that are Difficult calculation. Spherical trig is not intuitive to me. I don't know if it's intuitive to anybody, but it's not intuitive to me. So I start with the things that I can just do by inspection. Right? My, that's always my starting point to make sure that things just make at least that basic level of sense. This is a simple question. Let's say you did this. So would this program run and support all four errors? It would be the first one and then quit? It would stop at the first one. Uh, yeah, it, it fails at the first assert error. And, then, and so that's, a, that's an interesting point because I said you know, each thing, each assert is a unit test, and I kind of group them in functions. Kind of the the things that should get grouped together is if the first one fails, probably the rest are not interesting, <laughs> right? I, I know at least a good chunk of them are going to fail too because this one was something so basic that it doesn't make sense to keep going. And and so that's kind of a way you can think about what things make sense to put in the same function, right? Uh, okay, and then. So now we get a little bit more complicated. This is actually math required. So some random point, just pick random things. Uh, the same meridian, so the same RA, but a different declination, right? The exact antipode, so these are you know, opposite places on the sphere. So you, you add pi here and you make the negative there. Uh, and then a different point on that, uh, on that opposite meridian. So these are kind of all still kind of Interesting to think about, but not requiring too heavy duty uh, calculations. And so, in this case, uh, the distance from C1 to each of these we can kind of do by simple calculation. Um, so, C1 to itself is zero. C1 to C2 is along the same meridian, so that's just the difference in these guys. So, we can just do that kind of by I, right? The antipode is exactly pi, so we can put that in. And then a different point on the opposite meridian, you can do the calculation. Right? There's a little bit of math to do there, but you can get pi to do the calculation. Right? So these are all things you can do, again, still without spherical trig, but it's a little bit more complicated, and you have to kind of think about it some. So that's kind of the next level of testing that I usually do. And then I'll start using actual math. So here's kind of just two random points. Um, they could be you know, anywhere. I just pick random things. Uh, and now there's kind of some spherical trig formulas that we'll do. So here's, here's one, the spherical law of cosines. I checked that that actually works. So here's the actual calculation. This is the code doing it, which actually is a different formula. So this is important, right? So my code doesn't use the law of cosines to do that distance. Okay, it does something that's somewhat more robust than that. I that this is not a great way to find distances. But for something that is widely separated, it's perfectly fine. Uh, and it's checked that, that that works. And then I said, so that wasn't a great formula. So where does it break down? It breaks down in really tiny displacement. So things that are a couple arc seconds apart, it's got problems with. Um, so here's one that is that same starting point. Now I just add like 10 to the minus 9 radians times a few uh, to each one. This is the law of cosines version. And just for you know, gratuity, maybe, but I often will include print statements that show extra things that aren't, I'm not actually going to end up asserting, this distance comes out to be zero. Right? And so it's useful to kind of just see that. Right? <laughs> this is why I have this other code. So when you run the unit test, you'll say, oh, that, that one right, is zero. That, that's not the right answer. Our code gets the true distance, which we can calculate from a, a local uh, linear approximation, which is actually more right. Uh, oh, and good. So this is now, I'm going to use the all close, because this is now a really small number. So testing the same number of digits is not really a relevant measure. These, these numbers come out to be like 10 to the minus 9, right? So these are 
10 to the minus 9 times something squared plus 10 to the minus 9 squared squared. So it's, it's a few by 10 to the minus 9. Testing that to 12 decimal places is only really three significant digits. Right? So it's not that great of a test, right? So NumPy has this thing called all close, which tests a relative difference. So it doesn't matter what the e to the you know, at, you know, e to the n part is. It's testing that the, the relative difference is within, in this case, a, a relative tolerance of 10 to the minus 7. So you can again, specify that. There's also an atoll for absolute tolerance. Add that. So for things that aren't kind of of order unity, this is usually a better one to use. Okay. Anything that, yeah. It's the number of decimal places in, uh, yeah, so without the e to the whatever. So if it's something that's 10 to the minus 7, it'll be 0. 0.00000, or whatever. Right? And so the, it counts from the decimal point. How many decimal places at the decimal point? So it doesn't matter. Right. So, so it, it's not really that great of a thing to use for things that are very different from one. Things that are 10 to the 30 or 10 to the minus 30, you, you don't want to use uh, almost equal. For, for this kind of thing. Right, so that's what this says. That's exactly right. But like for all the tests too. Like well, it says the, the other ones are all things that are of order unity. Because then you require, right, right so, but then you require no. So these are pi and are, one, and right, these are all things that are close to unity. Yeah. And zero, you can't do the R call. Yes, that's right. You want to make sure this is zero to 12 decimal places. Right, I just want to point out that there is a function in. Okay, uh, so okay. Using it's the, the same as all close. No, you're using the take, like counting the number of significant digits to compare. Isn't that what this does? No, this one divided by the original. This is a relative percentage. This is rel this is percentage right. difference. Okay. But the one check significant digits, so if it's two zeros, you can still compare the significant digits. Oh, I see. So zeros zeros work on that one. Is your point? Okay. Good to know. Thanks. Okay. Um, good. So, so the point here is like you're testing a, th a place where you know that some some naive version of your formula would be would be wrong, and you don't get it wrong, right? That's kind of the, the thing that this one is. And it turns out that the other place that's tricky is at the antipode. So near the antipode, the distances. So it turns out exact antipodes are actually easy, but if you're close to an antipode, it, it can be a little tricky. Uh, and so this tests for things that are near but not quite antipodes, and kind of varies it slightly from um, exactly opposite and make sure that those come out right. So again, seven months, seven relative errors. Uh, so these are, are uh, you know, knowing where your, your code might fail, um, you know, it's, useful, it's useful to kind of have that in your head and, and when you're designing unit tests, then check all those places that, where it could be a problem. Or, or yeah, it does either way. You, you can you can have a vector, but yeah. could do all of them. You could, yeah. Yeah, you just create them all in a like, you know, list comprehension or something and you can find it. Uh, okay, so another one. So this is so there's there's a test precess that uh, is not pushed that I have on my, my laptop. Um, that tests it kind of on its own. But this is now an integration test. So I said I would mention a little bit about integration tests. Um, or not quite integration tests, but it's similar. So this test, that the code, the answers that we get are the same as what AstroPy gets when they do their calculations. There's a AstroPy.coordinates um, module that does kind of similar functionality as this. Yeah, they have a precess function. So you can see here's what it looks like uh, in the core class. Here's what the AstroPy version is, pretty similar. Um, so you create you create the coordinate in one place, uh, transform it to Equinox 1950, and then to 1900. So here it's called precess. From 2000 to 1915, and then from 1950 to 1900, uh, and then we just check that they're uh, they give the same answers. And the agreement's only 10 to the minus five in this case. Um, I didn't completely track down why it's not better than that, but 10 to the minus five is probably as good as we uh, need for most things. Um, so this is just testing. So it's kind of testing and get some external uh, version of the truth, right? So if you have some other way, some other package, or some other like a website, like there's there's a number of places where you you can 
uh, a website will do a calculation for you for particular numbers. Um, I've gone to, uh, there's some tests in Gaussian that where we use Wolfram Alpha to do some, you know, integral, some numerical integral, make, take their answer and try to make sure the Gaussian's result matches to some level of uh, precision. Uh, these are all really useful unit tests. Like make sure that somebody else, the way somebody else did the, did the calculation matches what your code does. Right? If you have an access to that, doesn't mean it's done the same way, and it's even better if it's done different ways, um, but these are all useful unit tests. Um, and this one's a little cheeky on my part, probably. Um, so in the full version of this, I put in, uh, there's actually there's extra statements that I kind of turned off uh, just for the sake of si uh, space on the screen. But it, you know, a time here is T0, T1, T2, or sorry, T0, T1, T2, T3, T4. Right? So we check how long does it take to create the, the object, to do the procession, to create that object, to do the procession. Um, and then we print out what those times are, and you can see celestial forward stuff is way, way faster than AstroPy, which is my, what I'm saying is the main advantage of using Cord, is that it's not too slow. Um, and then this is kind of a cheeky test, but it's not, not too bad, uh, is saying, <laughs> make sure that our times of, of doing these calculations are still efficient. So don't, you know, make sure we don't go in and add some code later that just like blows up the, the, the running time by a factor of we don't want to get slow like Astro. <laughs> huh? Uh, well, for this calculation, it's the same. I mean, it, it, it can do many more things than I can than this class can do. That's, that's right. But just about all of it, because it's, it's mostly it's units module, as well. uh, and it kind of keeps units around forever, and it's constantly doing unit calculations. Uh, anyway, so good. All right, so. That's a good question. Um, I don't know good ways to check the memory usage in a unit test. Um, I don't know if anyone else tried that. Sorry, what? You can do size, but yeah. For a single object, you can, right? But it's more usually the, the memory problems are usually when you when you're doing a big calculation. What's kind of the peak memory usage during that calculation? It's usually the number of objects you make is, is where those kind of like input things that stick around until the end without getting uh, garbage collected. So I don't know of a good way to do that. Uh, it's a good good question. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. So there's all. Examples. So, back to brainstorming. When should you write unit tests? Mm -hmm. I have an idea. When, when's the best time to be kind of writing unit tests? Yeah. Yeah. As soon as you hit a bug, you're doing <laughs> Okay, you're running your code, and you don't understand something, so you write a unit test to figure out where the bug is. <laughs> I didn't do that, by the way. I didn't know you good <laughs> 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 Before you write any code, so this is uh, absolutely uh, one time to write unit tests. Before you write code, yeah. oh. every time you add add something new, write the unit test for that thing. Is, is your assumption that thing in Gaussian that every API call you can actually have available to you or have a unit test? It's an ideal. We're not <laughs> achieving that yet. But that's what you would like. We're at like ninety five percent. We're not quite there. And is that related to, you know? I, well, I guess every actually, sorry, I think that every function has a unit test, but we don't get full coverage of every every line. Yeah, could you say something about coverage? Plus. It seems like this, this max, max sort of magical process where it tells you. Yeah, yeah, no, I'll, I'll get to that. I'll get to that. <laughs> so, I'm going to send some advice because when, when your code is running, you should write optimization. So I guess if you need to test the optimization, you should do it while that code is running. <laughs> Write more unit tests as, as it's running. Yeah, Erica. Once you fix something that was broken. Uh, when you find something that's broken, uh, you should write the unit test for that thing, or? After you fix it, write the regression test. After you fix it, write the regression test. OK, I'm going to, so that's a good, a good point. I, uh, I'm going to twist that in a little bit, a couple slides. Other point? OK, so, right. So this is all probably true. So 
I'm going to suggest writing it as you code, and, and that's a somewhat vague thing on purpose. Um, we'll do the following good thing. So this is my exposure. Why you should write it, at least kind of as you're writing code, also be writing the unit. That's uh, the basic recommendation. So first, you'll find the bug sooner. We already talked about that. So you'll be, as you're writing it, kind of before you even commit anything, you'll probably be able to find the bugs if you've got the, the tests and the code being developed at the same time. Um, I talked about this a little bit too. It'll help you build, you know, design your code better, right? You'll be able to get a better user interface if you're writing the test at the same time you're writing the code. And it'll be easier to write because you're already thinking, you've already seen, oh, I know this is going to be a problem at, you know, Antipode, so I'm going to write this bit of code. You've already realized well, that should be a unit test, shouldn't it, right? So every time you're writing a bit of code, that helps you think about what are the relevant unit tests that you're going to need to do. So the most extreme version of this um, is what David suggested. It's called test-driven design. This is, um, there's a lot of advocates, especially in the business world, for test-driven design. Um, it's a part of agile coding, you know, kind of corporate buzzword stuff. Uh, and the way test-driven design works is you first write the unit test. Right? You, do, you write the test. That defines in your head what you want this function, this class, this whatever, to do. You write that first. You don't write any of your production code. You just write the test. Then you run the test. And you make sure it fails. <laughs> <laughs> this is not necessarily a true statement, right? If you don't write the test right, but it will not necessarily fail. If no well, if you run it right, <laughs> if you run it right, it'll fail. If you if you messed up, you you may not fail your test, even though you don't have any functionality that's supposed to be supporting it. <laughs> right? So this is actually the the instruction. Right? And then write just enough code to make the test pass. No more. Right? If you feel like you should be writing some more code, write another test that's going to be required for that. Right? Every time you want to write code, you write the test first. Um, and just keep repeating. You ever get to write the little code? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the steps where you write code. Yeah. It is kind of That's right. Yeah. So I'm going to give what I think is a more nuanced and, and maybe accessible way of doing this. But I do this sometimes. Okay. This is I'm saying it kind of a little bit extreme, but this is not a, a bad way to go. And there's lots of times when it is very helpful to, to do this style. Um, uh, Oh, actually, here we go. This is the slide. So the way the way I actually recommend is um, you can you can decide whether you want to write the, the the code first or the or the test first. But the point is write them both kind of in concert. So sometimes, like David said, you, know, you may not really know how you want to write the code, but you kind of know what the user is going to want to do, right? In that case, writing the test first is probably a good idea, right? Write the test kind of write it as though you you're the user that you're trying to design for write what they're going to want to be doing, and then you'll have a better idea of what the code is that's going to support that. Sometimes, though, if you're writing kind of just really basic stuff, um, like, a, like just a, a library is supposed to do a lot, like this chord class, right? Um, you just know what angles need to know how to do, right? Like angles, you know, you need to be able to do trigonometry with them. You need to be able to, to wrap them around. You need to be able to you know, access them in radians and degrees. Right? These are all just things that you just know. And so you can start actually thinking about it as a class and what, is, what should this object know how to do. And then you can write the, the, the tests uh, as you're uh, kind of building that functionality. And that's, that's perfectly fine too. Right? Uh, but the point is like do them both at the same time. And in particular, uh, every commit that has new functionality should also, in my opinion, include the test that tests that functionality. So it doesn't really matter to me which one you did first. And, Git won't tell you <laughs> which one you actually typed in first. If they're both in the same commit, you can you know, imagine yourself being this fabulous TDD programmer, <laughs> uh, even if you wrote the code first. Git, Git won't uh, belie your secret. Um, so th the tests that I, I think are m most useful to, to do that way are what I call the normal usage tests. These are the things that you think the user is mostly going to do. right? Uh, and so those are the ones that you kind of show up in the same commit. Um, then usually you're going to kind of know, and maybe maybe as you were writing the, the back end code to support that, you might have realized what some of the edge cases are, uh, or you might just have some 
prior knowledge, like, oh, this is going to be trouble if in this case or that case. Or that thing. So you start writing extra unit tests to test these different edge cases. Sometimes that will require changing the back end code, right? When you realize that your test fails, like, oh, well, now I'll have to fix the code to make it, make it work. Other times, you know, you just write the test and then the test passed. And you're like, great, my code already did that. Good. Um, another one is useful. Like, sometimes you don't necessarily know what the right answer is supposed to be. Um, you do some calculation. And um, so an example of, in this case was we have in, in Gaussian, um, a random number generators, right? And, and in particular, we want those random number generators to be repeatable. So that if you put, uh, take a particular seed and you run it on your laptop, you'll get one simulation. You should be able to take that same code on a Linux box and run it over there, uh, and it should get exactly the same simulation. It should be completely deterministic based on that seed. And so we have some tests that where we just took our random numbers, outputted you know three three values, and said, assert that these are the three values you get. And then you can run it on a whole bunch of different systems and you make sure that no, none of the systems, because of compiler differences, anything, NumPy, you know, backend differences, anything like that, makes that fail, right? So these are just, just adding tests to, to check for regression. So if you don't think you have a good uh, regression test based on the test you've already written, add some gratuitous ones uh, just to make sure that later on, if something changes, you'll notice, if you care about those things being consistent. Um, now, integration tests are, are, you probably want to start thinking, does anything about my new functionality, is that going to interact with other parts of my code or other parts of other people's code that is worth kind of making sure everything talks together properly, right? So start adding some integration tests and do, do those all work together well. Um, and then we'll talk about, so when you do a pull request, um, I'm going to show you how to check for code coverage. and. The typical thing that we, Josh is familiar with me. Um, after you submit, you realize there's some various little branches that you missed. You don't have any tests to cover those. You don't have any tests of this thing, that thing. And just add a few extra tests to, to improve your coverage. Uh, if you, again, if you care, if you don't care, you can ignore that. Um, and then kind of once you've done a whole bunch of these for most of your code, now you can start thinking about writing kind of full on system tests, which will be more like a full program that, uh, will go from end to end of your, of your whole system. Right. These, are the, again, these are the things you guys have probably already have been thinking about, written in some, some version or another. But that's kind of the last step in, in this workflow that I'm suggesting. Comments about that before I move on? Yeah. When you, when you get in code review, is the testing part of what gets reviewed? And then how does say, yeah. I was expecting to see this test here. Why, where is that one, Josh? Who's going to sit up in the back of the room? Really out here. <laughs> <laughs> what happens when you have a, uh, you know, like, That's a good question. Um, so there's a couple. So the question is, what if you need a lot of input data, say an image? Um, do you want to put that in your in your Git repo, or, or how do you deal with that if you want that to be part of your test? So I've done two basic things. So one, um, you put it in the repo. Uh, and that's, I think, fine if you just have a few of them. I mean, the, the amount of space that GitHub allows is actually pretty significant. So if you just have a few kind of tests, and you want to reuse that, that image for as many tests as possible, leverage. Um, but sometimes it's, it's, it's just unwieldy to have that uh, data. And so what I usually do is as long as it's w-gettable, um, you can write a, a quick little Python thing that says, if this file doesn't exist, then you know, w-get it, store it here, right? And so you just have this little kind of um, you know, make sure file is local <laughs> or something function that you, that you can write that'll, that'll pull it down from some, uh, some website. And, and, and stage it locally. And so that way it's not in the repo, but it's, whenever you run those tests, it'll, it'll do that for you. And I've done that. Uh, this is a real problem. This, this caused problems with the, with the simulation software, right? The downloading for the supernova challenge. Interesting. Um, yeah, I don't know that I have quite better advice than just trying to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> what the implications are for that? You can you can you can wrap it in and say I'm skipping this test because I don't have it. If you want to run these tests, call this one. Um, 
Uh, well, yes, there's a kind of assert. Oh, uh, right, yeah, yeah, so that's a good point. So you, you can set it up so that if, uh, uh, yeah, so if if some precondition doesn't exist, it'll just automatically skip a bunch of tests rather than run them. So we have the, in, again, in Gaussim as an example, um, we have some, uh, one module that uses the LSST DM code, uh, and we don't, uh, I haven't tried to get that staged on Travis, so we have <laughs> the ability to, to skip all those tests if, uh, if Travis or, or even you know, just a random user doesn't want to download all of LSS TBM, uh, they won't fail their Galsim test because uh, of just this one little module. Uh, yeah, that, that's a good point. Yeah, so so we do a lot of that too, and that was um, in the in the unit test uh, the three parts of it, setup um, can be a, a significant calculation. And you can create some really complicated thing that your test is going to be running on. And, and that's common. That's what the very often thing is. That's right. It's a really good idea to get for analysis or testing or package. So how far do you take this? Are you writing a small analysis thing for yourself for doing science? Do you write a unit test? Or um, so not, not for, so like I said, scripts, I think you don't really need unit tests. The, the, the system test is the, is the basic basic test that you need. Um, yeah, though, as, as you start having, you know, a number of functions, um, I'll, I'll write some, some quick unit tests. I don't go quite to all the, uh, rigmarole, like hosting it on Travis and this kind of stuff. But yeah, if there's something that any bit of code that I, it's not obvious to me that I've coded it up right, which is common because I, and self doubting, <laughs> I suppose. Uh, then I'll write a, a, a test function. Um, so. uh, okay. Uh, oh, so this is what I wanted to say. So, um, this is Erica's point, I think. Um, so, if you get a bug report, this is the one time I absolutely, absolutely recommend you follow TDD. Okay. Uh, always. Make sure you write a test that reproduces whatever the user's bug is. So the user comes in and says, oh, I was doing this, and I had this problem. It gave me this wrong answer or something. <laughs> and if you have a nice user like Jim, he'll package up a nice little pickle thing that you can just put in your repo and load it up and reproduce exactly what he saw and, and get the failure. So always write that test first, because that tells you that you've properly identified what the user's bug was. Okay, so you can... If your test gets the same bug that the user told said that you got, you know that's the right test, right? Now go and try to fix it. Right? So this is the opposite order of what you said, but I think and I think that's important. So this is the time that I think TDD is is absolutely the right mode to, to follow, um, and and in particular that step, make sure it fails. Right? So this is your point. Like how could it not fail? Right? Well, if you haven't identified the bug right, like it, it won't fail, right? Um, and then fix the code and. and Release a new thing and talk to me. Happy to go again. <laughs> okay. Uh, when should you run unit tests? We talked about you were asking this before. So I have ideas. When 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 should you be running these unit tests? <laughs> so you have a test suite. Let's say you've written a, you've written a test suite. When when you run it? Like like. On this repo that you fund, when you type those tests, when you install the code. When you first install it, good idea to just make sure that things are installed properly. At the, sure, installing it on a new place. Yeah. Great. So this is one that I definitely recommend. So before, not necessarily before you commit, but definitely before you push. So um, before you you send your 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 new code out into the world, make sure you run it and you haven't broken anything else that anybody else is. Using, especially if you're pushing the master, but even if you're pushing to a branch, make sure that your code is, is working uh, before you push it up. Other comments? Other thoughts? Hmm? Writing. While writing, yeah. So this is what I was talking about. So you may not want to run nose tests all the time while you're writing, but that one function that you're working on that's in conjunction with the development that you're doing, you're going to run that one a you know, hundred times maybe as you're kind of working on a new piece of code. 
Uh, and so you just want to be running that one test, not necessarily the whole suite, but definitely you're going to run that one a lot. That's good. Yeah. When reviewing, so if you are evaluating someone else's code, you'll probably want to download it and run the test that they've written and see how it goes. On your machine, they might fail. They worked on Travis, they worked on their machine. Right. Good. Yeah. Other times? All right, what did I say? <laughs> uh, yeah, so working on new code, that one we got before you push a commit. Uh, Travis, so Travis is running this uh, uh, all the time. Uh, and uh, the other one that I think it's uh, important to do is if you're gonna, if you have a kind of a code that has releases and, and, and lots of people use it and, and count on a particular release, you want to really run that test on as many different possible systems. You know, go and start installing old versions of NumPy. Start, you know. What happens if you, you know, have the previous AstroPy version? What happens if you have an ICC compiler instead of a GCC compiler? Just try as many different combinations of systems and make sure it runs at NERSC, at Slack, at DNL, at Fermilab, whatever, right? Try as many different possible places where your users might be trying to run your code, run your unit tests. Yeah. So that's, and, and we almost always find various things that need to be tweaked up for uh, when we do the forget them. ICC has different warnings, things like that. Uh, okay, so just to show you, not everybody um, maybe has seen this. So this is what the Travis uh, looks like when when you uh, uh, have Travis run your code. So you can have Travis run uh, several different uh, kind of combinations of, of systems. So for the core code that you guys are, have cloned, it does Python 2.7, 3.4, 3.5. Um, Useful to be able to write both two and three is really the main point about that. Uh, so it works on that. You can see it ran for a minute and a half. Not too bad. Uh, it's pretty quick. Um, and that includes all the, the, the installation time. So that's the, the whole from, from cloning the repo to, to finishing at the end. Uh, the other thing that it does is it uh, uploads stuff to code coverage, CodeCov. Uh, and this is what this looks like. Um, so CodeCov will go through uh, and um, uh, check which lines of your of your software, which lines of your code uh, are covered by some test. So it's not um, a very kind of uh, rigorous uh, test that you've tested everything, right? It doesn't test whether certain edge cases are going to be problematic, but anything that's not covered at all, you know that it's you know, fragile. Right? You you don't really know whether it's working or not. <laughs> covered, covered, I don't know. Yeah, so so I run um, well. So I run nose tests with coverage, and that uh, writes out a dot coverage thing, and then CodeCov takes that and kind of analyzes yeah, so it in some way. Right. Well, he was asking like, how does it know which lines are executed? Somehow the interpreter keeps track. Yeah, yeah. Right, and and for branches, it tells whether you went both ways. So if there's an if statement, you test whether a test went true and false. Or if there's a while loop, it checks to make sure that it actually ended. Right? Or if there's an ex accept, uh, it'll check that something through that exception. It'll raise that um, So, so this will tell you. Uh, so there's a couple of things here. So this is how many lines of code were, um, you know, uh, in the running for being covered. Right? So it doesn't include comments and you know doc strings and things like that. Uh, how many of them actually got executed? Uh, yellow is how many got executed, but it was a branch and it only went one way, didn't go the other way. And then red, and then it never got touched. And so on purpose, this is not very well covered. This is 63% um, because I want you guys to write some of the uh, tests. I actually have tests that get it, get us up to 100%, but I want you guys to practice and try to see if you see what, uh, yeah, practice writing uh, some unit tests. Um, so to do that, I think you guys have mostly got the first bit, so go to this uh, GitHub page. Uh, uh, oh, actually, I forgot to uh, do something, but um, right. So I will update those instructions in just a second. <laughs> um, but basically, the idea is to look through the unit tests that are there now, uh, find something that you think is, is short enough. We only have now, I guess, 15 minutes. I was hoping to do half an hour, but uh, only about 15 minutes to do something. Uh, so we can we can extend into the the after uh, 
time if any, anyone who's staying for the hack part. Um, try to write something simple and just go through the process of <coughs> pushing it up to GitHub. Um, make a pull request asking me to, to merge in your, your new test. Uh, and we'll add that to the yeah, review. And I will, I will code review. I will review everybody's code. And just a sec, Phil. If anybody finds a bug, I will buy them a beer sometime this week. So it's not much, but uh, I will be appreciative of a, of a bug if you can find it. Wait, find it. Make a bug if you find it. Yeah. So, yeah, you're not allowed to add to the, the back end code a bug to, to the system. So, so hopefully somebody will get a pull request in before 2.45. That's not, not a lot of time. Right. Yes, so you can work in groups or individually as you prefer. Pair coding is perfectly uh, acceptable and a, a good thing to practice if you've never done it. So please do sit with the person next to you and try to design a unit test and, and do it. Okay. And, um, so we'll be modifying the way you can do tests, right? Yes, so let me, uh, let me just. So our mic is doing that, modifying a page there. Uh -oh. um, I'm just going to make the um, organizational Yeah, yeah, those now, are the ones. Okay, because do not interrupt you later. Uh, because nominally, we're yeah. going to 245. This is a half-hour conversation. And then after that, I meant to do this options. before the class. Um, there are tours of the labs earlier. And I have said, and for that, we had 315 said outside the assignments building to point in that direction. Uh, okay, so um, and if you want to continue working on this, you know, it's a path break, it's a path break. You can, um, oh, and for the, the hack and sprint there we go. organization, she suggested we come back here. Okay? And um, so yeah, you'll be leading that. So now follow things. Right. <laughs> yeah. So we'll have too much organization, anyways. Okay. Just yeah. That's right. So if you're interested in that, come back here at 315 for that, uh, for this part right here. Um, and then, uh, when the tours are done and everything, at some nominal time, is there someone named Oliver who knows about the pub that we can walk to? Is there a local person here? I saw a pub on my yeah. phone. I could probably find it. Like, okay. what, what you, yeah, you can just go in that direction yeah. across the tracks. Okay. So and there is a pub called Bench. Okay. Big Bench. Right. Um, okay, so I think that must be it. So I think around 5.30. Okay, so just be like kind of in that general area at 5:30, and then whoever wants to, we can uh, go to a local pub. Because they're fine. We just walk there since the weather's nice. Okay, so you got that. But you can go ahead and work out. Oh, and the coffee break, Anya says, is going to be fresh homemade. <laughs> okay, homemade cookies. So. I have a quick announcement too. So this doesn't apply to most people, but for those of you people who are involved in the details of DC One production, we will be meeting at 3:15 for a short meeting to get together. And talk about what's happening. Okay, well, you, know, you know who you are. Okay. Good. So, uh, just to let everyone know, so I, I just pushed something to the README. So, if you refresh that page, it's some more instructions than what was there a minute ago. So, what you're going to do is make your own branch. So, it has instructions on how to make your own branch. That's where you'll do your edits. And this shows you how to commit and push it. Uh, and then this shows you where to start your pull request. So, this is more detailed instructions than what I just said earlier. Okay. That's all you need. Yes, on the front page of the GitHub, you just kind of scroll down. So, so here, okay. just scroll down. Yes, to the bottom. I don't have to interrupt you later. Let's thank Mike, okay, for preparing this and everything.